finding that. Gave you a, an extra little thing tonight just uh, for fun. If you want to take a look at the yellow sheet, um, you should have that copy. And um, this is a fun little thing tonight. It's, it really does have to do with tonight's study. Um, and every once in a while, you'll see one of these come out. i tell you where I used to see them all the time was in Reader's Digest. I don't get that anymore, but um, it's a little, is that in the Bible? And it's really kind of surprising. Uh, go through and see how you do on it. There's 25 of them. Um, just, just do the best you can. I promise we're not going to grade it. So we're not putting grades in the grade book tonight. So um, it's just kind of interesting to see um, if, if we really know exactly what's in the Bible. What does the Bible say? Um, some things we assume are there and they're not. And some things we didn't know are there and they are. All right. So, so give that one a try just for a second before we get going here. I promise I didn't make any of these up. Well, take a guess. <laughs> it's like an achievement test. Just start filling in blanks. Just fill in the circles. Just fill in the circles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make a make a make a picture. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Are y'all good? Yeah. I, I know it would be. The, the truth is, I, I, did, I looked a lot of these up myself, and some they're from different translations even. So that messes with you too. Yeah. Of course, I was looking at it, so I, I actually got to look some of them up, so, <laughs> to see. I know, I know, I know, I'm, I'm testing your, um, your visual capabilities tonight. Okay, we're going to, we'll, we'll get to this tonight, we'll get to this part of the test in just a, in a little bit, and we'll go through some of these, but want to get, want to get into our study tonight, so. Uh, we're going to be in the second chapter of 2 Timothy, verses 14 through 19. So we're, we're kind of inching towards um, the completion of chapter 2. And um, I think this letter is getting, be- getting good. It just gets better and better and better the more you get into this, this letter. Um, remember uh, just a couple of things we've been saying about um, 2 Timothy uh, to kind of jog your memory of just a few things. Uh, this is Paul's second letter to Timothy the two letters are independent of each other, um, written probably not too far apart, but they deal with totally different things. Uh, the first letter that Timothy wrote really deal, dealt with problems in the church at Ephesus, where Timothy was pastor, mostly dealing with false teaching, uh, those kind of things. We spent quite a bit of time in that first letter. The second letter, uh, remember, is being written to uh, Timothy to encourage him because great persecution's broken out. And um, so just a couple of things to kind of remember. Uh, the author's Paul. Um, it was written to Timothy around A.D. 64, 67, really close to Paul's death. 
Um, most scholars put Paul's death sometime around 80, 64, 67. And so the time of this letter is right in line with when he died, was, was martyred for his faith in Rome. So um, we, those kind of dates, uh, there's markers in, actually in this letter that kind of point to that. Uh, this letter is also a little different from first letter. Uh, Paul, uh, of course, had been in prison, out of prison, but basically he was out of prison when he wrote the first letter. In this letter, he is in prison in Rome, and he's not getting out. Um, so he actually wrote this one from a prison cell. Um, <clears throat> so some of those things are interesting. Remember, I've given you um, a couple of key characteristics to remember, and I try to give these to you each time we come back in so that when we're kind of pulling a passage apart and digging into it, you'll have these kind of things in the back of your mind. Remember, most people call this Paul's last will and testament. That's number one, uh, first characteristic of it. This was Paul's last writing we have. Um, he wrote it um, right, right before his death. Um, and he's trying to encourage Timothy because, remember, Timothy's personality was one that kind of shrank back a little bit in his faith, maybe a little bit timid at times. And, and Paul's trying to bolster him because um, his time is at hand. Um, so that's the first thing to remember. You'll see a lot of comments in 2 Timothy that seem very final. And if you'll keep that characteristic in your mind, it causes even like the passage we're going to look at tonight to have a little depth of meaning for you to understand why he's telling him this, why he's giving him this instruction. The other thing is, and I said this last time, we're not quite to these passages yet. In the third chapter, we'll start seeing this. But another characteristic of 2 Timothy is he is warning Timothy about coming apostasy. Um, so that's the second characteristic, and that's key. And, and I've tried to, um, as we kind of talked about this one, get in the back of your minds to remember what the difference is between apostasy and backsliding. Uh, backsliding is something that a Christian can do. Um, if they drift in their faith or they get away from the Lord, a Christian can backslide. Christians cannot be apostates. An apostate was never a Christian. It's a person who may come in among us and be here, but they've never truly been saved. And he is warning him of a great falling away coming in the church. People who are not genuinely saved falling away. False teachers, people like that who are, who are kind of affecting the church and, and they never were true believers. So that's the difference between an apostate and someone who is backslidden. Okay. And then the third characteristic, and this is the more encouraging one that Timothy is receiving from Paul, uh, 2 Timothy speaks of the ultimate outcome of gospel preaching. Remember that as bad as persecution was, and even with the great falling away that Paul was telling him is coming uh, with the apostasy, he reminds Timothy that there is power in the preaching of God's word, that God's word is what changes lives. And that is the whole focus of the passage we're going to look at tonight um, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and following. He's going to give Timothy some strong instructions about the Word of God, which we'll see this evening um, kind of as we get into it. Um, you probably heard this story about the guy who felt he needed some guidance from the Bible. So he opened it randomly, closed his eyes, and let his finger fall on a verse. And it said... Judas went out and hanged himself. And he thought, that can't be from God. Certainly, that can't be God's will. So I'll try again. So he closed his, his eyes, opened the Bible, let his finger uh, fall quickly on a passage, opened his eyes, and his finger was directly on the passage that says, go thou and do likewise. And then he thought, okay, this isn't the way to read God's word. I have to be making a mistake. So I'm going to try it one more time. So once again, he closed his eyes, opened his Bible, let his finger fall on it, and it said, what thou dost, do quickly. That's a, dangerous, that's a dangerous way, right, to try to understand what God's Word is saying. But a lot of people do that, like randomly pick up their Bible, open it, and, you know, then this is what I'm going to read, and um, good luck with that method. Um, we can kind of laugh about that one a little bit, but I, I think... Um, Maybe that's a reminder of how sometimes we're a little bit um, sporadic, careless in how we approach the study of God's Word, um, how we maybe haphazardly or carelessly approach um, the greatest document man's ever received, this book. 
that's life-changing. And, and I think tonight's passage that we're going to be studying is going to be helpful uh, to us in that, in that. I'm going to suggest a book to you, that, and I'm actually reading this book right now. This is really good. This is a Dan Kimball book that just came out, and it's called How Not to Read the Bible. How Not to Read the Bible. Very interesting book. Um, it gives you some really important reminders of, of things that we do sometimes or, that cause us to miss um, what God is really saying. But there's some really interesting stuff in here that um, I didn't know. And so uh, as I'm reading it, I'm really loving this, but it's called How Not to Read the Bible. Um, and, and I want to give you 10 of these, okay? These are very helpful little things. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, just kind of how not to read your Bible, um, to think about this because Timothy is going to hear this instruction from Paul in the passage we're going to look at tonight about, about the attention we need to give to God's word, okay? And we'll, we'll get into that here in just a little bit. So um, here's, here's some clues how not to read the Bible. First of all, do not read the Bible like a textbook. And, and it's interesting, the stuff that he says here about that. Um, he talks about how the Bible is written to soften our hearts and make them open to what God is trying to say to us. But many times we approach it like a textbook where we're trying to fill our minds with knowledge. But knowledge puffs up. And so our, our approach to the Bible is just not to, not to learn trivia. Now, I gave you kind of a trivia quiz tonight, right, um, about is this in the Bible or not. And we'll get to that one here in just a second. But um, the Bible was written to soften our hearts, to fill our minds, not just as an information book. And if you read it like you do a textbook, just to glean information, you're going to miss some of the deep truths. And, and a couple of little kind of hints here for you uh, that can help you to keep from reading it like a textbook is, number one, always pray before you read. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you through his word. And then what you read, read slowly and listen for God's voice as you read. And so you shouldn't read it or study the Bible just like it's another great textbook for you to learn facts about God or spiritual truth or the historical narratives. It's really hard not to do that, right? Um, so it's not a textbook. Second, don't read it like it's a magic book, all right? A lot of people read it like the Bible's a good luck charm. It'll give you these little hints at how your day can go better, uh, little kind of magic pills about how you can be blessed or how you can get the promises of God today. The Bible was meant to be read like any other book from start to finish, but it's a story about who God is, who he is in the world, who he reveals himself to be, and what he wants to do in our life. It's more than just a quick fix pill book that kind of tells you, do this and you will be blessed. And, and this is getting at that idea that often we try to make um, the Bible and Scripture very formulaic, like do one, two, and three, and you'll be blessed. Now, we got to be careful sometimes because we play into that, right? Like Baptist preachers, guilty here, going to give you three points and an illustration, right? So I'm going to give you this formula, and, and or, or just even the way that I prepare a Bible study where I outline and I give you these points, the Bible is more than just follow these three prescriptions, these three points, and all will be well with you, right? Um, that's not the way the scripture's written and that's not the way we're supposed to apply it. So that's, that's an interesting one. Third, don't read the Bible like a rule book. The Bible isn't a rule book, though it does contain principles and standards by which we are to live. The Bible is not do it your, a do-it-yourself manual from God. Um, you're supposed to read the Bible um, and allow God's Word to speak to your life. And when you read it, you're supposed to allow it to wash over you and change the way you live out of relationship with Him. Um, but we're not to read it just like, I got to read all of these rules that has a tendency to push you towards legalism. So it's more than just a rule book. Um, fourth, and this, is, this one's kind of a good one, I think. Don't read the Bible like a chicken soup for the soul book. Um, <clears throat> over 100 million copies of chicken fruit soup for the soul have sold to date. And those books are collections of inspirational stories. 
And we love the inspirational stories of Scripture. And it's easy for us to get enamored with those things. But what happens when we get enamored with a great inspirational story from Scripture? We have an, a tendency to fantasize it, to make it almost science fiction-y. And we look at that story and we go, oh, that's a great story, but that could never happen for me. God's Word is supposed to come alive to us. And what we read in Scripture applies to us, whether it's the great story of David slaying a giant, right? Or Noah building an ark I'm out in the desert and God sending a flood. Those stories are more than just inspirational stories. Those stories are how God interacts with his people. And they're powerful stories for us, so we must not miss that. Number five, <clears throat> don't read the Bible like a gold mine of random sayings. That's what this list is right here. A gold mine of random sayings, right? Um, don't, don't read it like that. And, and think about that one, um, what, it's, what it's telling us. Often we do that, and when we do that, we pull one scripture out of context and we try to apply it to our life without reading the whole thing in context and what God's saying to us through it. So the Bible's more than just little nuggets of gold that we pull out and go, I'm going to apply that. We need to search deeply and understand why those things are said to us. Six, don't read it like a fairy tale. It's real. It's the truth. Um, I, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I, I believe it's literally just like it says. It's not, you know, a, a piece of fiction. Um, it's, it's the Word of God. The Bible's not uh, some great fictional piece. Um, we need to recognize today that if, if God really did part the Red Sea, that wasn't a fan a fairy tale story that just sounds good. It's the reality of how God works on behalf of his people. Um, so that's a powerful one. Number seven, don't read the Bible in isolation of others. That's a very interesting statement, but it makes sense to me. The notion that the Bible should be studied only by ourselves is the product of the Western church. You won't find that anywhere in the pages of scripture. The Christian life is a life lived in community with other believers. It is meant to be studied in the company of other believers in order that we may grow in wisdom from what we hear. Now, are there times when we spend time in God's word alone? Certainly, but that's only one way we do it. As we understand the, the need for individual worship as well as corporate worship, God's word is to be studied and read in the company of the saints. That's true. And there's a reason for that. That's because that's how we grow best in the company of others who come alongside us and study it with us. When you read in Scripture about how God's Word is read, often it was opened and read before a great throng of people who heard it together and God spoke. And so we need to recognize that often in our thinking today, we think, well, my personal quiet time is the time that I read the Bible. But we forget the importance of church the teaching of his word in the company of other saints and the preaching of his word. So that's, a, that's an important one to remember. Number eight, don't read the Bible only for other people's sake. Um, and this is one we talk about sometimes when we preach. We shouldn't be listening or reading God's word thinking, oh, I wish old so-and-so could read this. Or when we preach, oh, I wish Joe could hear this, right? Don't read it thinking about how this applies to someone else's life. Read God's word and let it speak to you. Um, that's the way it should be read. Number nine, don't read the Bible with a closed mind. H here's how I s would prefer to say that one. We, no matter how long we've been a Christian, how old we are, or how much we think we know, we have not arrived. We must always be teachable with God's word. God can show us things from his word that maybe we've never seen before if we remain open-minded, not closed-minded. And then here's the 10th one. Don't read the Bible occasionally. Don't read it occasionally. We're to read it all the time. It's to be a part of us. We're to, we're to put our eyes on it daily, to spend time in it. We ought to look for hunger for opportunities to be in his word, um, studying and reading it. So that's, that's kind of kicking this off just a little bit tonight in the things that he's going to say to Timothy. Um, if we will understand those 10 things and begin to take 
the study of God's word seriously, it will help us to live a life that's consistent and faithful even when times are hard. And so that becomes a very powerful thing for us. Now, um, let's look at this for a second before we kind of get into the text now because it's fun. Um, if you came in a little bit late and didn't pick up one of these, um, this is a kind of a fun little uh, sort of quiz we did tonight. Is that in the Bible? And there's a bunch of them there. So let me run through them real quick, as quick as I can, so we can get to our text tonight because these are fun. Um, first of all, that, that first statement, um, before God, we were e are equally wise and foolish. And equally foolish. Is that in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. So if you got no, you got that one right. All right? Um, number two, it's easy for him to go through the eyes of an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Is that in the Bible? Yep. So far, so good. Easy breezy, right? Number three, to thine own self be true. Is that in the Bible? That is not in the Bible. All right? That is um, from Hamlet. All right? Um, number four, do not throw your pearls to pigs. That's in the Bible. All right? Y'all got that one. So far, so good. All right? Um, number five, work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. Proverbs 12, 24. If you want to write the, I'll give you the references. Proverbs 12, 24. All right? Number six, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. That is in the Bible. That's uh, Proverbs 17, 22. Number seven, let your conscience be your guide. No, that's good old Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> and number eight, this is the day the Lord's made. We rejoice and be glad in it. That is in the Bible, Psalm 118, 24. All right. Number nine, God moves in mysterious ways. That is not in the Bible. That's a shocker, isn't it? That's not in the Bible. Um, we're, the origin of that phrase is uncertain. The phrase doesn't appear in Scripture. The idea may be present in Scripture, but not stated that way. Um, the phrase may originate from a hymn that's actually titled, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. Therefore, we think it's in Scripture. Um, number 10, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That is in the Bible, all right? Um, it, actually, in a couple of places, all right? Number 11, when God shuts one door, he opens another. Not in the Bible. Number 12, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's Proverbs 15, 1. Never put a question mark where God puts a period. Not in the Bible. To err is human, to forgive is divine. That's not in the Bible. That's Alexander Pope. That's a great English poet, all right? Um, number 15, God won't put more on you than you can handle. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. This is not a verse in the Bible, although it is a loose quote from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted what you can bear. All right? You're right. All right, number 16. God helps those who help themselves. Not there. <laughs> it's true. We do... We do hear these a lot. That's where those come from. Number 17, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that in the Bible? It is in the Bible. Number 18, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. Nope, now we got Thumper. Jiminy Cricket and Thumper. Yeah. I've heard it. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. All right, number 19, to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is in the Bible. All right? Uh, number 20, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That is in the Bible. Money is the root of all evil. That is not in the Bible. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. All right? 
Number 22, to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. That is in the Bible. Y'all are so smart. Number 23, spare the rod and spoil the child. That is not in the Bible. Shame on all you parents who quoted that scripture to your kids. Now you're going to go tell them, I'm sorry, son, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> and stoned them to death. That is in scripture. That's spare the stone and spoil the child. <laughs> All right, number 24. The truth shall set you free. That is in the Bible. All right. And number 25. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That is not in the Bible. All right. Those are just for fun uh, to kind of, you, you know, but there's a purpose to that. Um, it, it is, how, how well do we really know what Scripture says as opposed to what the world says? And, and it's really easy for us to hear sayings and things attributed to Scripture through our life. But if we're not diligent in studying God's Word, Inside some of those statements that we think are some, are some pretty humanistic um, kind of principles and ideas that really are not Christian. They're not, they're not consistent with what Scripture even teaches us. Well, the passage we're going to look at tonight, um, Paul is still encouraging Timothy. Paul, from a prison cell now, is encouraging him. It's toward the end of Paul's life, and he's wanting Timothy to be strong in the faith because he's about to pass the baton of faith on to him. And, and Paul's going to be gone. And Timothy is one that seems to shrink back some in his faith from time to time. So already in our study in these first two chapters, we've seen him encouraging Timothy over and over again to be strong in his faith. And tonight, um, we're going to hear him encouraging him regarding the Word of God, um, of being diligent in the Word of God, um, of spending time in the Word of God, of staying true and focused to the Word of God. And, and if you think about even in our day, we need the Word of God like a plumb line for our life um, to keep us kind of centered on Christ, focused on Him and His way because there's so many things that come at us today in our world that can cause us to get off balance, to get out of focus on Him and focused on the things of the world. And so if you've got your Bible there, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we're going to look at verses 14 through 19. And I just want you to listen to this. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you through it tonight. Um, and, and let's kind of, we'll, we'll kind of pick this apart a little bit and, and kind of dig into it. There's some really um, interesting kind of instruction that he's giving him here that I, I don't think we can afford to miss. So um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. If you're there with me, um, follow along with me as I read. All right, here we go. Um, remind them, and we'll talk about who he's talking about there. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Aminius and Philetus are of this sort who have, um, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Now, this is an important verse because it's one of the hints at some of the false teaching that Timothy was dealing with in the first letter when Paul addressed false teaching. So that verse 18 is a little bit, you, you know, remember I told you that that Paul never identifies who the false teachers are. And rarely do you get a clear picture of what the false teaching was. But there's a few signals in First and Second Timothy at some of the false teaching. This is one of the few verses that kind of points to some of the false teaching that Timothy was dealing with at Ephesus, all right? Um, some questions concerning the resurrection of the dead. Verse 18, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal the lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of christ depart from iniquity so really if you look at verses 14 through 19 that's a very powerful passage 
um, that's, that's really packed with truth um, for Timothy uh, from Paul. And, and again, remember our characteristics of this. Um, we know this is the last will and testament of Paul. We know apostasy is coming. That is, those kind of depart from the faith, uh, kind of led by false teachers, and that there's power in the gospel. And all of those thing, those three kind of tenets or characteristics kind of emerge into this one passage. You see a little bit of that coming out um, in what Paul is saying to Timothy here. Now, in, first, in, in 2 Timothy 2.14, 2, if you just kind of look at your Bible there, Paul tells Timothy to solemnly charge those under his pastoral ministry before the Lord that if they misuse the Bible, it will lead to their, and here's the word he uses, their ruin. Do you see that? That's a very powerful statement. So it, I think it's important for us to be reminded of, of who Paul's talking to in this letter, what's going on, and some of the context. Remember, Timothy at this point in his life is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the churches in the New Testament that we know the most about. We have a whole letter written by Paul to the church at Ephesus. In Acts, the longest chapter in Acts is Paul's farewell to the church at Ephesus. We know Paul spent more time at this church than at any other church that he started, the church at Ephesus. So this was a very loved, very important church. And if you remember when we started the study, I kept putting it up on the map, showing you where Ephesus was. It was a very strategic church for the advancement of the gospel in the New Testament world. It was a port city. Remember the Ephesian way passed right through it. The great commercial trade of that day went through there. So Ephesus was a place where everybody was either coming or going. And this church was very strategic because the gospel was going out into the world in all directions from Ephesus. And so because of that, they were influenced by all the false teaching that had come in there. And Timothy's being given the task of trying to keep them straight. All right. So when you look at that, you look what he says there. When he says um, in verse 14, remind them, who's the them? The church at Ephesus. It's the believers at Ephesus. And some of them have been making trouble for Timothy, right? Um, but he's saying, listen, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. And so those are some pretty powerful words if you think about it. Now, we should take this word from Paul very seriously like we do all of Scripture. We get our word catastrophe from the word ruin. That's our English word catastrophe comes from the Greek word translated here as ruin. What he is saying, listen, remind them of these truths of God because it will lead to catastrophe in the church if that doesn't happen. And, and I'm just going to tell you that when you look today at what's happening to the word of God in many of our churches, you ask that question, why are there so many churches and we're having so little impact in our world today? It's because God's word is being watered down to the church's ruin. And I believe that's happening. Exactly what he says here is what we see happening in our day. It is a catastrophe for the church when God's word is not preached and, and it's watered down. The truth is not told. When, when, it's, it, when, it, when we're not digging into scripture, we're not grounded in the word, it's catastrophic for the lives of believers in the church. And that's the picture he's painting here. And I think, can't you see Paul's heart here? Timothy, I'm about to go be with the Lord. I'm not going to be around to remind you anymore of this. But there is nothing more important than that you continue to preach and remind them of the truths of God that you have in his word. Because it's catastrophic for the church if, if you don't get that. It brings in all kinds of false teaching. Pe people get confused about how they're saved. Uh, it, it causes a great catastrophic ruin for the church. And so you can see his heart um, here in these things. And so what I want to do tonight is just, I've just kind of divided this into two sections. Um, and this is really interesting to me because he's going to use two sides of this. Um, and, and, and I want you to see this in the passage we're going to look at tonight um, in, in verses 14 and following. Um, I, I want you to see this truth. The first thing we need to note here is that it is possible to use the Bible to make progress in ungodliness. Now, let me say that again. I want you to see what he's saying here. It is possible to use the Bible to make progress in ungodliness. 
And I want to show you what I mean by that um, when we look at that. Again, Paul writes in verse 14, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit and to the ruin of the believers. And then look at verses 16 through 18. Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Interesting. You know what he's talking about there? Profane and idle babblings. That is arguments about the Bible that are of no consequence. Ba- vain babblings. And, and do, do you see what, what he's talking about there? Just this constant arguing about, you know, the tidbits of the Bible that don't make any sense. Um, and, it, and it causes ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer, he said, uh, which is a very powerful statement. Hominius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, concerning the resurrection, is, concerning the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow some in their faith. So let's kind of talk about this because in the most part, most of this passage, beginning in verse 14 down to verse 18, really deals with this use of the Bible that's causing some ungodliness, how, how that's happening. Now, um, you see the phrase in verse 16, they'll increase in ungodliness, literally that they'll make further progress towards ungodliness. The false teachers claim that their teaching would help you move ahead in your spiritual life. Paul sarcastically says, yes, you will make progress, all right, but progress in ungodliness. If you listen to their twisting of scripture, you listen to the, the profane way that they're teaching. And then, then Paul kind of piles up these words to drive home this kind of frightening point in our passage. Just look at your Bible there and let me show you this. He kind of piles it up so you see what it calls. In verse 14, it is of no profit. It's a, verse 14, it's a ruin to the hearers. Verse 16, profane and idle babblings. Verse 16, more ungodliness. 17, it spreads like cancer. That is that it spreads to other members. Um, 18, strayed concerning the truth. 18, overthrown the faith of some. The improper use of scripture is not a harmless activity. It destroys lives. When God's word gets perverted, twisted, watered down, when it gets pulled out of context, and folks, listen, this is happening today. Everywhere you look, this is happening. When that happens, it's ruinous to others. Um, It perverts the truth of what God's word says about salvation and hope and all of those things. So to me, nothing is more important than the preaching of God's word, the truth of God's word, and it's handled correctly. That's why he's going to talk about handling it accurately in this passage of scripture that we're looking at tonight. And so I want us to kind of look at this just a little bit. I'm going to give you these things kind of right off the bat, some improper ways to use the Bible, all right? because he talks about here. And, and I've already mentioned some of these in how not to read the Bible a while ago that I read to you. So some of these overlap a little bit, but think about this. Some improper ways to use the Bible. Number one, to use the Bible for knowledge without obedience is to use it improperly. Now, again, this one goes along with what we said earlier. We're not supposed to read the Bible like a textbook for simply gaining knowledge. Um, I think that's the charge that Paul had in mind in verse 14, when he says, notice it, remind them of these things, charging them in the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, all right? When it's just a textbook, when you're just using it for knowledge, then you can argue about who's the smartest. Now, I can, I can remember this happening um, during my pastor, especially my previous church. Had a large, I taught a college class there, and they liked to argue about doctrinal issues, all the time. They like to debate about Calvinism versus Arminianism. And they, they like to bring up these big topics. They like to debate all that stuff all the time. And I would sit and I would listen to the debates and I was going to say, and every single time it would come back to the same thing. What, what are you accomplishing? By all you're arguing about the tidbits of, of doctrinal issues, you're totally neglecting what God's writing in his word, what he's saying, the truth here. Now, there is truth to be heard. I, I grant that, right? But when we get kind of caught up in the trivialities of Scripture, just the knowledge of it, and we miss what God is saying to it, through it, then, then we've missed something. Paul said, this is very interesting, in 1 Timothy 1, so if you go back to the first letter, in the very first chapter of the first letter, in verse 5, he said, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Contrast that with using Scripture simply for arguments. 
Now, I look at where the church is today, and this is a big problem. Think about this. We have divided over doctrinal issues over and over again. And we've got whole denominations that think they're the only one going to heaven, right? We, we've got whole denominations that get caught up on one tidbit of doctrine. Maybe it's the emphasis of, on spiritual gifts or something like that. And we argue over it to the point that we divide. Even in the Baptist church today, Baptist churches cannot get along because we argue over knowledge of some simple tidbit in Scripture rather than recognizing who is Lord. Do you see? So, so to me, this is a huge one to use the Bible for knowledge and without obedience. And he says it right there, striving about words, striving about words. And if you think about most of our arguments, aren't they just simply a disagreement of words, a difference of how we word something? Let me, let me tell you what he doesn't mean by that, okay? That phrase, striving about words, is a very interesting phrase that he uses there. What does Paul not mean when he says striving about words? Let, let me give these to you because I think this is important. First of all, Paul does not mean that precise words in Scripture do not matter. When he says, remind them of these things, charging them before God not to strive about words, he does not mean that precise words don't matter. That's, that's not what he's saying. We would be wrong to con conclude that, uh, that that's what he's saying. Um, scripture does matter. And the precise words of Scripture do matter. In Galatians 3.16, Paul builds an argument over the fact that the promise given to Abraham uses seed rather than seeds. There are whole doctrinal issues that are, are, are generated a misunderstanding because of how someone interprets one precise word and they can get totally off. Now, I'm going to tell you that I believe 100% that once you're saved, you can't lose it. And I believe that is taught in Scripture but I'm going to tell you that precise wording in Scripture is very important for you to understand that truth. Because there is a place in Galatians that talks, Paul talks about someone falling from grace. The precise wording of that context kind of helps you understand and dissect that passage of Scripture to where you understand he's not talking about Christians falling from grace there. So precise wording matters when he says, you know, to charge them before God not to strive about words. That's not what he's talking about. Second, Paul is not saying that growing in spiritual knowledge through Scripture is unimportant. We should grow in spiritual knowledge, right? We should grow and be grounded in the knowledge of God's Word. That's not what he's saying. He often mentions the need to grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding. In Ephesians chapter 1, in Philippians chapter 1, in Colossians chapter 1, he talks about all of that. As we'll see in a moment, accuracy in handling God's Word is crucial. So Paul is not discouraging careful Bible study here. That's not what he's saying. He's saying getting caught up on trivialities. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean here in just a minute. All right. So he's not saying it's unimportant to grow spiritually. And then third, <clears throat> Paul is not saying that a Christian should not be a good student of the Bible, able to accurately defend the truth. Um, we ought to recognize error. And we ought to call error, error when we hear it. And we ought to understand Scripture well enough to kind of recognize error. Um, we're going to hear him say exactly that down in verse 15, that very next verse, where he'll say, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when he says, um, charge them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit. Now, you recognize that there are things in Scripture to me that are set and steadfast. They are not arguable doctrines, all right? The divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, that's one of them. That God is three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's not arguable. That this book is inspired by God. Timothy's going to talk about, Paul's going to talk about that when we get to it here in the very next chapter. He's going to talk about that, all right? That how God's word is inspired by God. There are basic tenets, what sin is, man's fall, how we're saved, basic tenets of the faith. But recognize that there are secondary or and tertiary doctrines that are less firm in Scripture that we can argue about till the kingdom comes. For example, all millennialism, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, right? Pre-trib, right? Mid-trib, post-trib, right? Now, many of us in this room 
have pretty settled ideas of what we believe Scripture says. But if you make that an argument and a test of fellowship between another Christian, you are greatly mistaken, right? We should never be so dogmatic about second and, and third level doctrines that Scripture simply does not completely confirm because we make those tests of fellowship and they actually cause division among Christians. So recognize there are basic tenets of the faith that are doctrinal that you should not argue about, right? That to me are settled in Scripture and we ought to recognize those and if someone's in error, we ought to point it out to them. But there are secondary, tertiary doctrines to me that you can argue about. For example, the doctrine of election. Greatly debated. All right? Now, if you come down hard line, doctrinally stand on one particular part of that, you're going to cause division, right? So, so when I try to teach those things, I try to give points of view. I try to get you guys to see these are the different views that are considered legitimate in Christian circles. You need to pray about it, read it, study it. Now, do we form strong opinions about those things? Absolutely. I do. I mean, I have strong opinions about all those kind of things, what I believe, um, but I think it's hard to be dogmatic about some of those things that simply are not completely and finally confirmed in Scripture itself. So that's kind of what we're talking about there um, when we kind of look at that one. So, so think about that very first one. Um, um, to use the Bible for knowledge without obedience um, is to use it improperly, all right? And that's some ways that we do, striving about words, all right? So here's the second one, you ready? To use the Bible for worldly ends is to use it improperly. Um, notice Paul's words in verse 16. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Now in verse 16, Paul's, Paul refers to profane and idle babblings, or, or some translations have it worldly and empty chatter. Does anybody have that in their Bible? I mean, my Bible translated, translated as profane and idle babblings. Anybody have that? Uh, worldly and empty chatter, all right? That's interesting because that word profane in the Hebrew literally means worldly talk, all right? So that's where we're kind of getting this idea to use the world for worldly, the, use the Bible for worldly ends is to use it improperly. Um, in 1 Timothy 6.20, Paul uses the same phrase, all right? And I want you just to hold your place there and just go back. I want you to see this. He uses the exact same phrase phrasing the same Greek words in 1 Timothy 6.20. So just flip back to that. I want you to see this. Here's what he says. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. What was committed to his trust? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word, right? Guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. He uses the same phrase, okay? And that's very interesting. He's probably talking there um, about kind of the same kind of idea. Now, what would be some kind of worldly or empty chatter or worldly ends that sometimes Scripture is used for as an example that you might see today? To line my pockets. Profiting off the word of God. We see it today vastly out of control. Mega churches who are making millions of dollars, pastors who are taking triple digit speaking fees, profiting off of the teaching of the word of God. That is using scripture for a worldly ends. That's one big example that we see in our day. We see this often preached today in what I believe is heresy, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Where if you, and, and what are they doing? They're profiting off the word of God. That's the vain babblings, right? Do this and you'll be blessed. Do this and you will prosper. Do this, give this much, you'll, you'll, be, you'll prosper. So I, I think that's a part of what it's talking about here. And I think in American Christianity, we are seeing it played out before our very eyes, this idea of the profiting from the word of God. And, and I think that's dangerous. That's to use the Bible for worldly ends through um, worldly and empty chatter, okay? Um, there's a danger to that to me because to me it attached some work that you do to the salvation of God. And anytime you see a church attaching something you do, whether it's giving 
or, or, or any of those kind of things, you know, giving money in order for you to be blessed, to make God like you more, working to do this or something, that's, that is worldly ends that someone's, that is, you've got to work for that rather than recognizing the grace of God. So that's two. Now let me give you two warnings here to remember. False teachers are always popular. And it's true. Because they say, and Paul's going to use this phrase with Timothy. We're going to see it the next few weeks. They say what your itching ears want to hear. Okay? So false teachers are always popular. Um, that's not to say that everybody who is, a, who is a popular preacher today, that we should listen to them with a little more critical ear. But I'm going to say to you, listen to them with a critical ear. Listen to what they're preaching. Some of them have a huge platform and is it be, being used to glorify and honor God or is it being used to line their pockets? Okay, so, so listen with a critical ear. It's, it's always popular. Second warning here is that Christians to avoid such teachers and their teaching. Avoid them. Turn them off. Do not listen to them. Um, and I could name names here, not going to. If you want a list of names, I can give some to you. But I'm telling you, there's some that you should avoid like the plague. Um, because I'm telling you, the wrath of God will come down on them one day for how many people they're leading astray from the truth. All right? All right, here's number three. This is some improper uses of the Bible. Um, to use the Bible to teach half-truth as truth is to use it improperly. You want me to tell you who's a master at this? The devil. He started it in the garden. He spoke half truth. And ever since that day, he's been doing that. All right? So it is improper to use the scripture to use half truth to promote it as truth. And, and that's, that's what Satan did in the garden that caused the fall of man, right? Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a key for us there. Um, notice verse 18. Um, in these verses, Paul speaks of these false teachers. In verse 18, he says, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Um, that's an interesting phrase. Look at what that says. It's very confusing when you read verse 18. Had the resurrection already passed? Yes, Jesus had already raised from the dead. Half truth. Was that what Paul was talking about? When was he, what was he talking about? Our hope in the resurrection is our own resurrection one day, right? And, and that's very powerful. They were teaching a half truth there that, if it were the whole truth, which is often kind of what Satan, like it was the whole truth, like what Satan does. They were teaching that the resurrection had already taken place and they had verses from Paul to back up their views. All right, because Paul pointed to the resurrection. Paul often wrote of the fact that Christ had risen and that we are risen with him. But he also taught that there is a future resurrection of the body, which these men denied. They argued that the resurrection was only spiritual and thus was an accomplished fact. Now, you might wonder, well, what's the big deal? Why is this worth contending about? Because remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that if there's no resurrection from the dead, we're still in our sins and all hope is lost, right? It's, our faith is futile. And so Paul taught that. So this is a very important thing. Listen, you got to mark it well. Heresy always begins in truth. A little bit of truth mixed with a lie is still a lie. Okay, so we have to remember that. And so that's a very powerful thing. If you think about this, half-truths used as truth is an improper use of God's word. We need to tell the whole truth. We need to tell the whole thing. If we tell people that if you come to Jesus, he's gonna make your life hunky-dory, everything will be great, come to the abundant life, you'll never have any more problems. You'll never, you know, you come to Jesus and here's the truth, all right? The whole truth is, yes. That's part of the truth. You come to him and he will give you an abundant life. You come to him and he'll give you a peace and a joy that passes understanding. But you come to him and you've just got on Satan's bad list. It's not going to be easy. The whole truth is that when you become a Christian 
It's going to be tough every single day. You can't live it on your own. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be times when you're going to fight to stay on your feet as a believer. That Christian life is a life of battling. It's a life of warfare, right? And so think about that for just a second. We can't just tell half-truths. When it, we got to tell the whole truth, uh, to preach the truth, all right? Let me give you these um, three tests of false teaching. These are good. Um, these are some questions you can ask yourself um, if you want to know if something's false or not. Even if you're listening to someone and you have questions in your mind, should I be listening to this person, you know? So these, are, these are some good things. Three tests of false teaching that'll keep you from falling prey to false teachers like what he's warning Timothy about here. Test number one, does it honor God and exalt Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Is it about the man or is it about God honoring him? Um, Nancy and I, I'm talking about Nancy Guthrie here, and I sometimes trade books and read books. And every once in a while, Nancy will bring a book to me and say, this one really bothered me because all he does is talk about himself. Beware, right? The first test that ought to raise a flag in your mind is it, who are they glorifying? Are they glorifying themselves? Are they glorifying Jesus? Are they exalting the Savior? You know, who, who's it about, all right? Test number two, does it humble, proud, fallen sinners? Does it cut? Does it convict? Does it humble proud fallen sinners. Sound doctrine always brings sinners to the foot of the cross where they recognize their own brokenness and need for the Savior. It always does. Um, and I think we need to remember that. Test number three, does it promote holiness? So those are pretty good. Now, the fact is, in our look, just look at your Bible there for a second. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, just look at it. This is, this is a Bible study, so I want you all to kind of see this. The fact is, that's what, six verses there, verses 14 through 19. Four out of six verses there, Paul presents the negative side, sounding the alarm for us to understand, listen, beware of false teaching, of those who twist the Scripture. Beware the church must always beware that that is present. Why is it present? Because we live in a fallen world and the enemy wants to undermine the work of God. And the best place to do that is right here in the church, right here among God's people, to get us away from the word, not spending time in it like we ought to, not grounded in it, kind of mishmashy on what we believe. You, you see what I'm saying? Weak in our own understanding of the word, a little bit of half-truth kind of sneaks in, begins to cause division. Do you see what I'm saying? Arguing about profane, you know, striving about words, the, the kind of things he's talking about here. Recognize here that four out of the six verses, that's what he's warning Timothy about. That's how serious this is. But let's get to the good part. I've got to move fast here. Um, because the second half of this is so powerful to me. And really, I see this in two verses, verse 15 and verse 19. But God's people should use the Bible to make progress in godliness. We ought to use God's word to help us grow in him, to grow in godliness towards him. Uh, for example, verse 15, his instructions to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Highlight that verse, underline that verse, put it in parentheses, circle it, whatever you need. That's a call to you and I and how we are to handle this book. All right, that's, that's who we're supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to handle it. And then look at verse 19. Despite all this bad, verse 19, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. What do we say? persecution's coming, last will and testament of Paul. He's about to be killed for his faith. There's going to be a great apostasy. But what was the third characteristic? There is power in the gospel. There's power in the word of God. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And that's pretty good. Now, four ways to use the Bible properly in growing grace. And I'm just going to run through these really quickly. I will point out to you where I'm getting this from the scripture so you have it there. Number one, the proper use of the Bible requires the proper approach. 
the approach is in verse 15. Be diligent. Be diligent. Um, the word there translated as be diligent is interesting. It means to be zealous. Be zealous for the word of God. Be, be hungry. You, you ought to have this dogged determination to get into Scripture, to understand what Scripture says, to dig in. I mean, to me, I always talk about this. I hope this whets your appetite because that's what we're doing here at church is whetting your appetite so you can't get, wait to get home and get into it yourself a little deeper, to, to dig deeper. Um, and that's what ought to happen. So the, the proper approach is be diligent, all right? Second, the proper use of the Bible requires the proper relationship. Here it is. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to who? God. There's the relationship. God's word has a relationship to who? God. So when you come to God's word, you don't just come seeking knowledge for yourself to kind of fill your brain with knowledge. You come before him. This is his word. God, what do you want to say to me through your word? This is God speaking, okay? Holy Spirit, help me understand what God is saying to me through this. I'm reading in the book of Exodus right now. And boy, there's some parts of Exodus you can get bogged down in, right? But it's God's word. And every single thing he has in his word, I believe he can speak to us through and my prayer needs to be, God, what do you want to say to me through this? This crazy law that I'm reading that makes no sense. What are you saying? And sometimes it's as simple as order matters. You know, order matters. God cares about the smallest details of your life. Sometimes it's that simple, but do you see what I'm saying? There's a relationship to it. So the proper use of the Bible requires proper relationship. Number three. The proper use of the Bible requires proper skill. Go back to verse 15. Here it is. Be, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. There's a relationship, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's the skill that you need? Rightly dividing the word of truth. I don't have all the answers. God, I don't want what somebody else says about it. I don't want what I feel about it. God, I want you to show me. Be diligent. And God's given us so many great tools today that are at our disposal in order that we might rightly divide the word of truth. We ought to look into all of those things to find how we can. But that's why it should never be read simply in isolation. Jim Elliott, um, y'all recognize that name, Martyred in the Jungles, um, was at Wheaton College. And he wrote this in his diary. And I, I thought it was so good I put it on the screen for you. You might have a hard time seeing it, but here's what it says. He wrote, my grades came through this week and they were, as expected, lower than the last semester. However, I make no apologies and admit I've let them drag a bit for the study of the Bible, in which I seek the degree AUG, approved unto God. That's good. Try that one next time your grades aren't so good, right, on something. Just so that works. All right. So the proper skill. All right, number four, the proper use of the Bible requires the proper foundation. And that's key. Um, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. God stands by his word. That's why the Bible says every promise of God is yes in Christ Jesus. He stands by his word. It's like a solid foundation for us. And then he gives us these kind of two statements that reflect the important aspects of our own relationship with him. One is the Lord knows who are his. The Lord knows those who are his. Paul says the first part of the seal that he gives us is that he knows we're his. We belong to him. Salvation does not begin with man. It begins with God and what he does. He plans it and he executes it. And we're his. And he desires to be in relationship with us. And he will speak to us through his word if we diligently seek him. Second, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Um, that's interesting. Ephesians 1, 1, 4 continues, God chose us that we would be holy and blameless before him. We are to seek him and his holiness. We can be assured that we belong to the Lord because he has called us unto himself. He saves us and we belong to him. We are his. Christians should be living for God's approval. And that's the truth that he points out. 
here in this passage. All right, I got to close there. I've already gone over, but we got, we got through it. I pushed through it. All right, good. This is, a, this is a great passage of scripture. You guys remember 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. That's good. Next week, we're going to be in verse 20 and following, and we're going to talk about, um, oh, that's right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm always excited about that, but I, I hate kind of missing one, but we'll be back to that. We'll be, next time we're together uh, in our Bible study, we'll begin in verse 20. That's a great passage of scripture, verse 20 to the end of chapter 2 is really powerful about how we can be useful to God, how God, what, what we need to do in our lives in order that God might use us, how, how our life can be useful to him. Okay, other comments, observations, anything you guys want to add tonight? Thank y'all for being here. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time tonight in your word. Um, and God, the, the time that you give us, Lord, just to dig deep. God, my prayer is always that um, when we open your word together as believers and we dig into it, and we would see things and hear things, God, not, not from me, but from you. God, that would cause us to want to go deeper um, in our own walk with you, would create in us a love and a hunger for your word. God, I pray, God, that we would be grounded um, doctrinally in the truth of your word. God, we'd know what we believe and why we believe it. And we'd be able to articulate it. And God, that you might be able to use that to your glory to draw others to you. God, that we might be a mouthpiece of hope pointing to Jesus Christ. And God, I pray, Lord, that even as we leave this place tonight, God, that we would leave here recognizing your call to us to be diligent students of your word. God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Bless us as we go from this place tonight. Bless us as we get ready for Sunday as our choir meets this evening. Just bless the time they have together. And God, we just pray, Lord, that um, you would use us to your glory. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for coming tonight.